Hi, uh, welcome to our October 9th, uh, 2020 uh, ODA webcast. And uh, uh, today we're gonna have a very exciting topic to talk about ODA 19.9 release. And with me, uh, I have um, my colleague Carlos Ortiz. Hi, Carlos. Hey, Paul, good morning. Hi, team. Okay, so let's get started. So our agenda is uh, as follow. You know, we, we're gonna uh, talk about the 99 release. You know, of course, it's gonna re, uh, include the latest uh, October 2020 uh, release update uh, for the Oracle database. And then uh, the two new main features for 99s uh, are uh, the CPU pools. We're gonna go over that and uh, at least, and uh, as well as the uh, KVM for applications. Then we have some additional features such as uh, uh, TD, transparent uh, database encryption support, and also storage resize and clone of um, uh, data guard standby. Then we'll leave some time for Q&A. So next slide. Um, so, so as usual, we usually do this uh, quarterly updates and uh, that includes the latest uh, database uh, release updates, um, uh, which is the October 2020 uh, uh, REUs. And that will be applicable to all the databases that, that we support from 11 to, to 12 to 18, as well as 19 Oracle databases, right? So they will all have the latest up, uh, updates. So you can up, upgrade your database in ODA to, to the October release, okay, updates. All right, next slide. So at this point, we'll talk about our first main feature for 19.9, which is CPU pools. So I'll let uh, Carlos to go through the, the, this feature details. Carlos? Hey, thank you, Paul. So team, we now support CPU pools. And, and with this, database administrators are gonna be able to manage the CPU resources. And it's supported in both bare metal and KVM environments. What is key about this, right, is that some customers want or have a very critical database and they want to ensure that, uh, that, that uh, it performs at its best. So you can assign a CPU pool to that one and no one else is gonna touch those CPUs, right? So that's gonna, that's gonna guarantee a quality of service, right, for, for that database or also for your VMs. So there's two types of CPU pools that you can create, right? We call it BM for bare metal or VM for virtual machine, right? Bare metals are for databases and VM pools are for virtual machines. All right, so a quick note that you cannot uh, share CPUs among different pools. They're gonna be dedicated to its own CPU pool. This is only supported with Oracle Database 12X and higher, not the 11 version, okay. And this is ideal for database consolidation, right? The Oracle Database, uh, we have customers who wanna put a bunch of databases in there. But as I said, if you have one that is critical, you can now assign a CPU pool specifically to that database and avoid or eliminate this noisy neighbor problem, right? Someone who's doing a test and death may take a lot of resources for a certain time affecting the performance of the primary database, right? Now you can avoid that. <clears throat> and here's an illustration. In, in, in the rectangle with a number, it's an example of a XA-2M, right? It has 32 cores. And here, let's imagine that the customer only licensed 16. Right, so you're only going to be able to create pool with those 16s, and in this case, in this case, um, they create three pools, right? One for virtual machine and two for bare metal. And on the right hand side, right, again, you, you they may have three databases that they don't really care much about the performance. You can put them all in a single pool. There is no limit, but that database number four. If it is a critical database, you can assign that, in this case, that BM CPU pool number two to it. And on the left-hand side, right, you created a virtual machine CPU pool, and you can have as many VMs as you want, right? It's um, obviously taking performance requirements into consideration. Yeah. Hey, Carlos, uh, one point I want to make here is that uh, they don't have to be in a, uh, you, don't, you don't have to assign all the cores to a CPU pool. You can still have an assigned CPU so that could yes. be used just as normal as well. So, so it's not like you have to assign all the CPU cores to. Exactly, CPU. you don't have to. And as we're gonna see, 
right? You can modify your CPU pool to decrease or increase the numbers. You can leave some not used in a CPU pool. Yes, you have all that flexibility. Yes. Okay. And so we have a new set of CLI commands. The top five here, right? You can create, list, describe, modify, and delete CPU pools. And the two bottom ones are for other in CPU pool related changes. A database administrator may want to know, okay, I have this critical database. I was using this CPU pool, but now my performance got affected. Something happened there. You can go to this new command and gather information of the historical changes to that specific um, to, to that specific pool, right? VM or, or bare metal, or even a database. Okay. So here's uh, uh, the, the help on the create CPU pool. And I just wanted to highlight two things here, right? The dash BM and the dash VM. These are the parameters that you're gonna use to set up either a bare metal or virtual machine pool. Okay. The other commands list and describe on this window, you can see that is the list CPU pools. And on the left-hand side, I have three CPU pools uh, on this one. And the type, right, it tells me the first two are bare metal. The third one is a virtual machine. Look at the number of cores. Uh, that 20, this is a testing machine. So I, I put 20 on the VM, VM just to illustrate a point that is coming. Okay, and then the associated resources. So on the CPU pool one, you can see that I have three databases that are using the CPU pool one. On two, it's only one, the PMDB2. And I don't have any VMs at this point, right? The describe command, if I take the name of the CPU pool, the VM, then on, on the bottom illustration, you can see uh, the same information at the top, but I want you to pay attention to this one on the bottom here, right? The CPU allocations. And specifically this over here. I mean, just take a look at this CPUs. This is an X7M, right? Maximum was 36 cores. So you're wondering, well, why is it showing 59 CPUs, right? The reason is that Linux defines or treats a, a, a CPU as one of the CPU threats, right? We have... Um, an 18 core in the X7 or 16 in the X8, each core has two CPU threads. So in the X8, you have a total of 32 cores. So you will have 64 threads or in Linux terminology, 64 CPUs. So when you look at this section of the CPU allocations, you're gonna be able, you're gonna see up to that, uh, that number of CPUs, okay? And I highlight this because Paul is going to talk to you about the KVM creating a virtual machine. And in there, you're going to see another term, right? The vCPU, the virtualized CPU. And those virtualized CPUs map to this CPUs that you see here, right? We call them online CPUs or physical CPUs, right? So yeah. that's, keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. So, so sometimes it's a little confusing when you hear the term vCPUs or pCPUs, which is uh, physical CPUs. But there are sort of one-to-one -one mapping. One is from the host base perspective. The vCPU is from the, the virtual machine perspective. So again, just have, keep that in mind. And they're, they're different from cores. Every core equals to two vCPUs or vCPUs. That's the easy way to remember. Good segue, right? To, to just remind you, uh, to customers, just talk about cores, right? It, uh, that, that's the metric that we use for licensing. That's the main one. But just be aware of this new terminology on physical CPUs. Okay. Now, the audit records. The command here, right, is list audit records. These are the ones that I have on this specific testing machine. And you can see the resource type. As I mentioned before, right, it's, it's going to be the bare metal pools, uh, the VM, CPU pool, and databases. What changes were uh, related to CPU ch changes happened here? And I'm gonna illustrate um, using this VM pool here, right? You notice that in the blue, that's uh, when it was created and it was modified in that yellow one. So if I run the describe command, you can see that it was created with four cores. And then I describe that ID on the yellow, 
right? You can see that it was modified with 24 cores. So a database administrator is gonna be able to just follow the historical changes on these resources. Okay, and, and this is the first implementation that we do that you see on this uh, audit records uh, related to security. We're gonna, in the future, we're gonna be expanding uh, the functionality. Okay, and um, you just saw CLI, right? But we also have it on the browser user interface, right? Here is just uh, the main screen. You can see on number one, how we have a new option there, CPU pool. Number two is the listing of your current pools. Number three, that's the tab to create a new CPU pool. And then for each pool on number four, right? You're gonna get, I wanna view the details, I wanna modify it, or I wanna delete it. And that's what I wanna show you here, right? So if you create it, you specify what kind of pool you want, and then the number of CPU cores. Now keep in mind, right? It's, uh, it's gotta be, the minimum is two, and you can go in increments of two. So it must be an even number all the time. And at the bottom, you see the same description that you saw, but this is in the buoy, right? It's, um, oops, sorry, I went up. Now, modifying the CPU pool. Um, I wanted to show you here this one at the top, and I picked a VM CPU pool to show you uh, the, the screenshot, right? Because it has this specific section here, right? You can modify it to lower number of CPU cores or higher, uh, but, it's, but if it is a virtual machine CPU pool, you're gonna get these two options that you, that you see here in the yellow box, right? It's a, you can apply the changes to the VMs that are running, or you can choose not to, and, they, and the changes will take effect when the VM reboots, okay? And then there's gonna be a condition sometimes when you modify the CPU pool, and now you have less physical CPUs than the virtual CPUs that were specified for the virtual machine. That's this box here, force run, right? You just say, I don't care, go ahead and run it anyway, right? You click here. And at the bottom, it's just um, showing you, right? That you can delete uh, a pool. And here, right on the buoy, the audit records that we talked about, you're gonna be able to just see all the records. And, and these changes will remain, right? There is no options uh, for the administrator to, to delete it. We don't have a command, okay? So they can keep it for um, historical changes. And you can imagine now that we have CPU pools that a lot of the commands that we have changed. If you create a database, now you can specify, right? Do I, which pool do I want, right? And the same with describe, modify, clone, et cetera, right? And the VMs. Two, that's for CPU pools. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Paul to talk about KVM. Um, sure, Carlos, uh, let's go to the next slide. So um, most people probably know this already, right? Why virtualize? And uh, so these are sort of the main benefits uh, everyone sort of know, know about, right? That you can partition a physical uh, server into different virtual machines and uh, for consolidation purposes to better utilize the memory CPU storage that's in that physical machine. So that's, that's one main benefit. Of course, uh, by doing that, you can reduce number of uh, physical servers and serve, save space and, and power. And, uh, and then of course you can also provide virtual machines and application isolations, right? So you can patch uh, one virtual machines uh, without touching the, the, the other applications or, or, or database. Um, so, so it gives you that isolation capability. Um, and of course, you know, you can easily do quality of service, right? You can assign so, so many CPUs for one machine and different number of CPUs for uh, another virtual machines, right? So you can sort of manage the, 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 uh, the resource. Uh, uh, you have more flexibility to, to, to do that. And of course, you know, we have this concept called solution in a box where you can put a VM in an application in a VM, uh, middle, middleware in the VM, and then also database in a VM. So you have this uh, whole solution in a physical box, right? So we have a lot of customers that do that with ODA already with the, the OVM technology. Uh, but, but I'm gonna talk about KVM today. So next slide, please. So what is uh, KVM? It stands for Kernel-Based Virtual Machine. And uh, this is a, uh, 
uh, a virtualization infrastructure that uh, uh, turns the, the Linux kernel into a hypervisor. Think of it that way, right? It's a, it's a uh, type two virtualization technology, but it's been around for over 10 years now. So it's very mature and we have a lot of customers using it. Uh, uh, most of the user community know about KVM. So it's not like a, a risky kind of bleeding edge technology. It's a very mature technology. And it uses something called um, uh, uh, a quick emulation, which is a, a, a generic and open source uh, uh, machine emulator and virtualizer. Uh, so again, so it's, it's an open source and also leverage the built-in Intel virtualization technology in their chips, right? So, so again, on the x86 system, so it's built into to the CPU as well. And of course, it's uh, also the, tech, the virtualization technology used in Oracle Cloud. And that was one of the main reasons we're uh, moving from OVM to KVM so that we can integrate with the cloud infrastructure a lot easier, right? So this is the sort of the direction, you know, we're, we're going with all the on-prem systems. And uh, uh, next slide, please. So with the ODA 19.9 release, uh, we're gonna integrate the KVM support uh, 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 with ODA. And initially what we'll, we want to do is uh, to support, uh, to put the applications in the KVM first and keep the database in the bare metal. And uh, it will be integrated with uh, our command line uh, interface, which is ODA CLI, and as well as our browser uh, uh, user interface. And we can do complete KVM lifecycle management. You can create KVM, modify, delete KVMs, either with our, our uh, buoy, you know, just point and click, or just simple one command, right? So again, makes it a lot easier, right? I did it with the Linux command, and it, it, it takes a long time, and it's very complicated. So again, we've simplified the whole process, right, with the, the KVM integration. And uh, so with this, this release, the 199 release, KVM in ODA is treated as a black box, right? So uh, even though we, we provide the infrastructure to easily create KVM, but user will be responsible to install the application inside the KVM and manage the, the, the virtual machine themselves, right? So this is a kind of the first step. Uh, in the next release, we'll be able to do database, complete database management in the KVM. But in this release, it's, it's only a black box approach for application. That's why it's a, we recommend users just putting applications in the KVM for now. And uh, uh, let's see, so, so with that, you can put your application in KVM and talk to the database uh, still in bare metal, right? Which you will, you will not you know, have any performance degradation on the bare metal and, and still get the benefits of the kind of the best of both worlds. Um, and then you can isolate the, the database and application workloads and patching. Okay, next slide, please. So here's just a quick uh, overview of the architecture comparison with our existing support, which we continue to support is the Oracle VM. That's a type one uh, hypervisor, right? So you have to basically reimage the system, uh, the blue disk to put the hypervisor on it, right? Whereas KVM, you know, you can just uh, start a KVM on the Linux uh, operating system, right? So you don't have to touch the database, right? So it's a very flexible um, architecture so that you can run the database in bare metal and then just start up a KVM and put your application in it, right? And like I said earlier, it's aligned with our whole uh, virtualization technology on the OCI, the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. So when we do the cloud integration later or, or what we do today with the backup to the cloud, all that you know on the cloud, it's running on KVM, right? Okay, next slide. So here's another chart that really kind of compared the OVM and KVM, the differences, right? So the part in blue are the big difference, right? For example, when you want to do OVM, you have to reimage the whole system. Uh, with KVM, you don't have to do that. You just have to, to use our ODA CLI or our buoy to, to create a KVM. So it's very flexible. And then um, uh, with uh, OVM, it was uh, all command line based, right? So, so with KVM, we have the browser user interface support. And, um, and both technology support Linux and Windows guest, v, uh, guest VMs. And then the, the next three um, that, uh, that's coming in the next release, uh, with OVM, we currently support the database uh, in one virtual machine called Odabase, right? So all your database has to be in that uh, Odabase VM. But with KVM, uh, we'll be able to support multiple 
database database VMs in KVM. So that again, that's coming next in the next release. And then also the hard partitioning technology that uh, that we support with the uh, uh, OVM today will, will also be coming in the next release when we support database in KVM. Um, so these are sort of the major difference between OVM and KVM. Okay, next slide, please. So this is a typical ODA 199 uh, KVM life cycle management, right? Uh, it's actually fairly simple and straightforward, right? There's like uh, this first three steps is just prepare the, the infrastructure for KVM. So you create a CPU pool, you know, so Carlos talked about that. And then the next step is that you create a VM storage for your uh, KVM. And again, point and click, and I'll show you the screen screenshots uh, in the next few slides. Uh, very simple, right? So you don't have to worry about ASM. You don't have to worry about ACFS. Uh, you know, uh, so it's just like a two-step process, right? You can create a VM storage, create a V disk for your KVM. You can have a dedicated V disk, you can have a shared V disk. It's all very simple to set up. Then, uh, of course, you have to set up a network for your KVM. So again, it's point and click. You can create a, a virtual network for your for your KVM. So once you've done that, then you can create your KVM uh, with an ISO image, right? Whether it's a Windows operating system, Linux operating system. So you can just uh, start up the VM uh, with the uh, ISO image, like if you're installing a real uh, physical server, right? And once that's done, then you just uh, copy the application over, install the application, and like you would do with any machine, right? So, so once you've done that, you know, over time, you may want to modify KVM. You, if you need more CPUs, more storage, you could create additional VDisk or, or modify the network. You know, very, very straightforward to, to modify KVM now. And then of course, if you don't need it anymore, you can just delete the KVM, create another KVM. So all this could be done with our command line interface and, uh, and the buoy. So let's go through some screenshots to see how easy it is. Uh, so, um, so this is, you know, again, the, you know, the, with 19.9, you're able to just point and click and assign uh, cores to the, to, the, to the CPU pool uh, that Carlos talked about earlier. Um, next slide. And then this is how you create uh, VM storage and virtual disk. Again, point and click, you know, um, so very simple. Uh, next. Okay, create virtual network. Again, you know, point and click, right? Just set up the virtual network. So that's it. It's, so with these three screenshots, three screens, yeah, you're set. The next thing you do is you create a KVM. You know, you can see that, yeah, like for example, here we picked a VM pool one, you know, so you just, uh, uh, and as well as you can pick up the, the VM storage and virtual network. And uh, let's see, what else do you have to do? There's some other options you can set up. A yeah, memory well, size. Yes. Well, here, right, I, I just want to highlight to the team, if you look at this section here in the middle, that's where you define the vCPUs, and there's two values, right? You define the, the vCPUs to use, and you also define the maximum, because we allow you to ch make life changes, right? You can decrease or increase up to this maximum number over here. And this virtual CPU is the one that maps to the physical CPU that we talked about. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, you can also see the tabs on the top, right? Right now, this is the VM instance. You can also look at the VM storage, the VM disks, and the virtual network on, on those tabs as well. Okay, um, next slide. So, so everything you saw was just GUI, right? Very simple, point and click, you know? So you can set up a VM very quickly, right? With, with the 99 with the uh, uh, release. But you could also do everything uh, uh, I've just shown you in command line, right? And so all these are the sample commands that's uh, available to you with 19.9. And there are a lot of different options, right? With these commands. So this is all in our documentation. So you can see all the different options you can do with this. You, um, I mean, this is again, sample commands, right? So it's not, uh, not everything uh, that's new, but I just wanted to be able to see the exact same thing you do on the, on the buoy, you could do it with command line, okay? Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so, so, so here's some use cases for, for KVM, right? Again, we talked about keeping the database in the bare metal and application so you can have that, that isolation and uh, solution in the box. You know, if you need to have uh, 
let's say uh, JD Edwards uh, uh, in, in the KVM, you can do that now and keep the uh, database uh, separate, right? So that you could deliver the whole ODA as a, as a solution, right? We have third party that does that today with OVM, right? You know, there's a, there's a company called Temenos uh, that delivered their core banking application with ODA. Uh, they put their application in OVM today, but they can easily put that in uh, KVM as well and deliver that as a solution, you know, like a bank in a box, right? Or, you know, um, again, you know, if you need certain type of guarantee for your application, um, you can uh, put that in KVM and a sure number of the, the cores, memory and CPUs and so forth, right? Um, now, I didn't really address some of the licensing issue, like I said earlier, that uh, the hard partitioning for database is coming in the next release uh, with the January uh, uh, release updates. But for now, there's still some good use cases, right? If your customers are using standard edition, which is socket-based license, then it will have no effect on license. You could do that today, right? Put the application in, in KVM and run all your databases, uh, bare metal, there's no license changes, right? So it's uh, because everything's included. As well as, you know, customers who has ULAs, also, you know, uh, licensing is really not impacted uh, by the lack of a hard partitioning with this release, right? So, so they can use all the cores for application and for database in bare metal. So, so these are some of the good use cases, you know, uh, with this release with KVM support. Okay. Uh, I think that's the end of the KVM part. So, I'm going to talk about the next feature. Next slide, please. Which is the transparent data uh, base encryption support. So with 19.9, uh, we where again integrate the, the, the TD support with uh, uh, um, with our database, so that. Uh, but what is uh, TDE? Um, so TDE enables you to encrypt very sensitive data that's, that's stored in your tables or table spaces, right? And uh, and this is actually uh, what we call uh, we encrypt the data actually at rest. So it's actually the the data that's on your disks are actually encrypted. So in case someone actually steal your machine with the um, with the with the disk in it, right? So they look at the disk. Uh, all the all the all the data blocks are actually encrypted, right? And uh, so that's that's called that's why it's called encryption at, uh, data arrest. And then uh, and of course there's also key management, right? So so we 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 support the infrastructure to uh, uh, for the key management for the TD as well. And um, so with this support, we allow you to create database with, uh, that's uh, TD enabled, right? So you have an option during the database creation time to encrypt, you know, uh, to uh, en encrypt the, uh, uh, the database uh, at rest. And uh, so that's one of the options. And, um, and so I'll, sh I'll give you a, show you a screenshot after this. And then of course, TD is part of uh, Oracle uh, uh, Enterprise Edition Advanced Security Option. So, so when you purchase a advanced security option, this comes with it. So, so obviously you have to license that. All right, so next screen, I'll show you how to do it. So in the buoy, as you can see, um, you can enable the TDE when you create a database. Now, but what this means is that, uh, uh, that, that you need to enter a, a TDE um, uh, wallet password, right? And uh, so in the future, when you have to do operations with this database, such as creating a backup, uh, then you'll require to enter the TDE password, right? And so, so that's just kind of extra things you have to do. But we, so we, we allow you to create database with TDE enabled now. So, so again, it's a, it's a feature that's being asked by customers and it's also a security uh, thing uh, 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 when they have the advanced security option. Okay, so at this point, I think uh, we can move on to the, uh, the next new feature. Carlos, you wanna go through the next Yes. Piece? So database storage resize, right? This is a feature that is available today with the, the OVM, the virtualized order platform on Oak CLI. But now, right, with, with, with 99, we're making it available for Oda CLI. And it is only for ACFS storage, but this feature or what this new capability allows you to do is to resize your data, record, redo, or flash volumes. It doesn't resize the disk group. And here's an example with uh, the list DB storages command, right? And this was run on an X7. That's why you only see um, uh, data and Rico, right? And 
So imagine that you have this data volume that is 99.9 .9 gigabyte and you, you need 10 more gigabytes, right? The command that you will run is, is the modified DB storage and notice the DS, right? That's the data size, um, the data volume size. Notice that uh, that parameter has a value of 10. So what this means is just add 10 more gigabytes to my existing capacity, right? So you gotta be careful here. If you need 110, don't put 110, it'll make it 210, right? It, uh, and when you run it, here's list deep storages again at the bottom. Now you can see the difference from 99.99. Now it's 109.99 capacity. Okay, so that's, that's a new capability with a modified DB storage. And uh, here is the help for that uh, command. And in the big box, the yellow box, that's the one that I used in the previous example, DS. But you can do the same thing for the flash, the recall, and the redo volumes. And I have an example here of what it looks like on an HA. It's a little bit harder to see because it's black, white and black. Uh, but you can see the four groups there, data, redo, reco, and flash. Okay, those are the ones that you can modify. And the previous screenshot that I show you on, on the previous slide is it was an X7. So here's what it would look like in an X8, right? You can see the data, redo, reco. On the X7 and older systems, uh, the redo and the reco were combined. That's why you only saw two groups or two volumes. But here you see the three volumes on the X8. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the database storage resize. Another capability that we were lacking today is that if you set up a data guard and you, and on your standby, if you wanna make a clone of that standby, it wasn't supported. With 19.9, now you can do it. Okay, so here's an example of the, the buoy, right? For the clone database. And, and write a customer would clone a standby to take advantage of that data, right? They can run a DevOps environment, uh, some testing or do some development, or they can just set it up uh, database on, on, on the target, right on the standby side to do some reporting, for example, or anything that they can do. You just make a clone of that database. And on that drop down menu, right, it will list you the databases that are available to create a clone, right? You need, uh, users need to know what their standby database is and clone it in the, um, right? But three things here that, that you need to remember. You can only clone databases that use ACFS storage, right? We do not support uh, today CDB, cloning CDB databases. And also, right, if it is a TDE enabled today, we cannot do it. It's something that is coming in the future. Okay, so that's, uh, that's cloning. And that is everything that we have for you on 99, um, but we can go to, to questions. There is a little blue hand in your, in, in your window for the participants. You can go ahead and raise it if you wanna ask uh, um, a question or you can just put it in the chat. Up to yeah. you. Or you can just unmute yourself and then uh, speak to your microphone. That, that that works too. I think we're gonna need to unmute him. It, right. it, uh, yeah, yeah. If they raise the hand, we unmute him. But Paul, I see chat twelve. Do you see any questions there? Um, I think we answered most of the questions. I think Prasad, Ritu have been answering some of the questions that came up. Okay. Perfect. So team, again, raise your little blue hand. If you have any questions or post them on the chat. Okay. If not, you know, Paul and I, you can just send us any questions that you may, may come up later. And um, Paul, anything else that you want to add? Um, no, just um, want to see if there's anybody else that uh, raised their hand. I guess you don't see it, right? I do not see any hands, no. Okay. All right. So I guess. Uh... So you know where to reach us, any questions, send us an email. We also have an alias, uh, email alias for the database appliance. Throw any question in there and you have an excellent group of people supporting from development for technical support, right? Supporting your questions. So 
Thank you very much.